I'm so, so honored to introduce our next speaker. Um, so I, I feel like uh, um, our next speaker, Natsai, um, she's been just such a major figure in the larger biodesign community. Um, and um, I first saw her uh, give a keynote uh, speech at the Biodesign Challenge, I think it was last year, maybe even two years ago now. And um, she's just done such phenomenal work and has been able to frame uh, the whole field of biodesign in a really unique way. Um, and has also really been exploring textiles and materials, in addition to um, doing a, real, a bunch of really marvelous science communication. So we were both parts of uh, participants in a couple of different uh, science communication efforts over the past couple of months. So it is such an honor to introduce Natsai, and uh, you are joining us from the UK, Natsai, so we appreciate you from taking time out from your Saturday to be here. So everybody, can you uh, join me and again, giving some snaps, some emoji love, some claps for Natsai Audrey. So Natsai, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you, David. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay, thank super. You. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and I have a, a slight admission that I'm giving a talk I've never really given before. And um, so you'll forgive me if, if I'm a little bit, uh, you know, hesitant um, with this narrative. The, the reason why it feels so kind of like existential is because I stopped speaking uh, as most people have uh, since COVID-19 um, happened. Uh, and while I stopped speaking, I started thinking a lot. And so a lot of what I'm going to share to you is part of wider thought experiments uh, around the role of design um, and, and what, what needs to happen next. Um, and, and the role of design as, as, as traditional design practice, traditional design practice, um, but then how design is kind of existing in, um, in the, 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 the biodesign community uh, more, more broadly. So um, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Am I sharing it already? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Okay. So, I'll let you know when it emerges. Super. And thank you so much for, for sharing. So Biosummit is all about prototyping and hacking. So you are in the perfect space, uh, space to share your, your new, not totally formed thoughts. This is exactly the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Because um, I guess the, the other thing that I would really love is what people think. I'd love to know is what people think, but also uh, how do I go full screen? Um, I think I need to stop share first, go full screen. If it's a PDF, you may also try like view, view full screen. Um, but if not, also no worries. Okay, let's try this. And then, okay, we that have looks that. great. Yeah, that looks, that looks quite good. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, feedback is is really welcome. And um, uh, if anyone has anything that they want to add to this, I'll be so delighted to hear from you. Um, but yes, so design is kind of confronted with this pivotal moment where we're thinking about um, what comes post COVID nineteen. Um, what comes as a response to the climate emergency, the biodiversity loss, uh, what comes in response to the Black Lives Matter movement that is a global movement, uh, what is the point of design uh, and what does this have to do actually um, with emerging biotechnologies? Uh, since we're talking about the design of life, I kind of think it's got everything to do uh, with that. So, um, oh, for some weird reason I can't I go through my slides. Okay, I can. Here we go. Um, so this is the experiment. This is the, 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 the thing that we've been kind of trying to figure out a little bit uh, more of are the systems that are at play when design is at play. Um, and if we can uh, better understand those systems that perhaps we can use design to start to make shifts and to interrogate them a little bit more. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Nature's right at the bottom and the logic is that we're extracting everything in a very sort of mechanized industrial uh, way to bring value that has created the world that we live in today. Um, and so from nature, we beget technologies, modes of productions, export commodities, economic models, epistemic logic. Um, and what's really interesting to see, and I'd love to be able to build this out as like a digital tool, because you can actually toggle the design system that's at play uh, and start to ask very specific questions. But what we want to ask here is how design has actually evolved uh, in tandem with technology 
Um, so you see design coming out of the artisanal realm of the guilds and becoming craft alongside, alongside the spinning wheel as a technology. Steam engine shifts that over to design for manufacturing. Electric energy equals mass production, which creates the conditions for design for consumption. Um, the Bauhaus movement arises from this and suddenly design is democratized in terms of who can, who can have access to it. The arts and crafts movement is also a part of this uh, time period as well. Um, and as information technology brings about automated production systems and our global supply chains open up um, and, and we start to outsource production, design for corporate strategy kind of kicks in. And so uh, advertising becomes a design space design thinking becomes a, a mode of design. Um, and so today we consider uh, ourselves to be living in an age where we have interconnected information systems, decentralized production, digital services, knowledge capital as being the new economic um, uh, model. Uh, and we're really seeing that design for value added services comes into play. Uh, so interface design, service design, and then bam, COVID-19 <laughs> and uh, everything feels like um, it's open uh, up for uh, a, a new consensus. What does that mean? What do we do with all of this knowledge? What do we do through these systems of power? Um, what does design want to be for? I think is the question that we are asking. And so um, at Faber Futures, um, we're really an agency that is finding lots of different strategies to um, seek questions, uh, seek modes of asking them uh, to arrive at alternative visions of the future, um, but also asking how you might go about building them. And so um, we're an agency that is operating really at the intersection of this question of nature design technology and society. Um, and I think one very useful way in which we found uh, talking about the work that we do is kind of divvying it up into these um, spaces because our activities uh, are quite intuitive a lot of the times and then you have to kind of try to make sense of it. So um, through materialities, that's where design as a product is being interrogated. This is where we're doing a lot of the work uh, with um, microbial dyes, um, trying to figure out how to work with them, but also trying to figure out what systems they might exist within. Uh, we are interested in interrogating the future uh, and we use this as a critique space to ask questions and to build prototypes um, and, and to start to bring in value drivers to what kinds of futures we'd like to see in that space. And then there's the cultural space that we're working within, um, asking questions about uh, the mindset shifts we need to create and partnering with organizations who actually want to embed that in their activities and grow wider communities um, to, to be able to share that knowledge. So today I'd like to very quickly, because <laughs> we don't have much time, uh, take you through three key projects I think across um, this rubric that um, demonstrate not just um, an output, a materialized artifact. Um, but I think what they are starting to show are some of the design methods and processes we're actually implementing to be able to do this work um, that opens it up um, and, and creates possibilities for, uh, for change. So you might be familiar with Project CD Color. Um, it's a, a very <laughs> long um, and ongoing project uh, that I began in 2011. My training was architecture before going into textile futures uh, and uh, in, in thinking about technology um, in, in, uh, and specifically synthetic biology uh, as a student in an art school surrounded by textile looms, I think my immediate understanding of um, this emerging field was that it was going to completely change our material ecosystems. Um, and so I started to work uh, at University College London as a design resident with Professor John Ward at the Biochemical Engineering Lab um, as a curious uh, understudy to his uh, general microbiology. 
Um, and not long into that, uh, I started to work with a host of different wild type organisms, um, understanding their provenance, uh, as simple as a cactus plant or, um, you know, a rosemary plant from my garden. And this fascinated me that we had tools to be able to uh, really kind of interrogate at a microbial scale what might be happening um, in, in soil. But I started to work with um, an isolate, an isolate uh, from one of my uh, plant um, microbiomes, uh, Streptomyces silicala. It's an organism that lives in the soil, uh, producing pigment uh, in the lab. Uh, we interface with it outside as the smell of rain. Uh, it gives beetroot its flavor. It's producing lots of different uh, compounds and molecules, um, uh, of, of which pigment uh, is, is the one I found most interesting. Uh, the pigment that it produces, actinoholin, depending on the acidity of their environment, uh, shifts from bright reds and pinks to purples to blues. Uh, and the question that I had was whether or not we could um, start to work with this organism to uh, dye textiles. This is the first experiment uh, from a project called The Print Room, uh, where I figured we, if we extract enough pigment from this, uh, we can incorporate it into a binder and silkscreen uh, a beautiful print. Um, and while this worked uh, in, in theory, in practice, within uh, you know, a few short weeks, the, the dye had faded. And this really gave me um, a moment to pause and ask the question, was I approaching this as a non-scientist, as a half-baked textile designer, um, as a, you know, somebody who didn't have the necessary expertise in any of these domains? Was I approaching this uh, with, with, with uh, the, the right logic? Uh, and I realized that maybe there was something I could actually learn from the organism uh, to move beyond this notion of extracting the pigment and uh, replacing an ingredient to an existing system. What if there was another way? And so this was the other way, uh, growing the bacteria directly onto the textile, which yields, it turns out, <laughs> a color fast dye without any chemicals um, and a significant reduction in the amount of water that was being used for, uh, in relation to uh, common industrial practices. Um, and these two things, the reduction of color use, or three things, a color fast dye, but without any uh, chemicals, were like, these are the holy grail of textile uh, manufacturing. But I guess as somebody who at the time was not particularly interested in becoming a textile manufacturer, what I found so fascinating were, was the implication of having to grow the textile directly onto, grow the microbe directly onto the textile. What this was uh, making very clear to me is I would need to come up with a whole host of different processes to be able to replicate these experiments, but also uh, tweak and, and modify the outcomes. And so I, over the years, developed um, a range of different protocols to be able to do this. Um, and these are recipes that allow us to uh, create different um, uh, visual effects when we're working with uh, this organism. Essentially, you're fermenting uh, the bacteria onto uh, the textile. So all sorts of different variables uh, become your toolkit uh, as, 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 as you proceed with this. And so one of the key questions I had in 2017 was, could I arrive at a place where I'm so good at this because I've been doing it for so long that I can actually start to sketch what uh, the garment is going to look like before I actually make it. Um, and so I went to Ginkgo Bioworks to do um, a pilot residency there to figure out how I could bring all of the lab-based protocols that I've been developing um, in an environment that allowed me to scale some of these systems of production. Um, and so scale void assemblage uh, was uh, the, the project that we created there, um, where two things happened. Uh, I realized that I also had to become a pattern cutter to make this work, uh, because I needed to adapt, adopt the pattern cutting of the garment to fit with the laboratory protocols, something I'd never had to really think about before when I was just dyeing uh, long pieces of textile. Um, and then uh, another beautiful thing happened, which was uh, realizing that the fabric that you use when you're, uh, when you're uh, dyeing uh, um, uh, the, the, the textiles could be assembled in a way that starts to replicate the print over multiple um, pieces of textile. 
Um, and so we've taken some of these learnings and we've uh, initiated them into different kinds of uh, projects. Um, and more recently, Assemblage uh, 002, which was commissioned by the Cooper Hewitt and is now in their permanent uh, collection. This is a reversible coat um, that kind of just showcases all of the different ways in which we are um, dyeing uh, with streptomyces CD color. So everything from organic prints to uniform dyes and um, uh, prints that you know you can sort of uh, and draw on Illustrator and build tools and frameworks and protocols to be able to um, uh, sort of activate on, onto the textile. And so we're doing this with a wild type organism. And in parallel, I'm reading Yuval Noah Harari's Homo Deus, um, and he talks about how um, organisms are algorithms and that giraffes, tomatoes, and human beings are just different methods for processing data. But you should know that this is current scientific dogma and that it's changing our world beyond recognition. And of course, synthetic biology is built on this um, idea that you can build uh, tools and platforms um, to, to engineer living systems. I was really intrigued to look at how multidisciplinary this effort is, how multidisciplinary it has to be for us to start to open up what those application spaces are. And the key question I had is, what if you put design as an upstream uh, collaborator rather than um, just your marketing guru? <laughs> um, what, what new tools, what new platform technologies actually emerge when the kind of thinking that I was trained to have and engage in can actually start to live here. And what we are seeing is that um, immediately designers are kind of uh, opening up a new constellation of material um, spaces uh, within the, um, the industry from algae, bacteria, fungi, mammalian cells, and that it's starting to yield really um, interesting and exciting propositions like modern meadows liquid leather or ecovatives scaled up um, um, mycelium architectures, uh, bolt threads and Stella's um, spider silk yarn. Um, and then we sort of say, okay, right, the, the challenge, right, that everybody uh, here and elsewhere um, is faced is um, how to scale these processes. Um, and, and, and this question of scale has been something that um, has really kind of uh, haunted me to a certain degree uh, from trying to figure out something on one small petri dish to creating uh, you know 10 garments at any given time uh, and, and, and you think you're scaling until uh, an, an investor says but do you want to scale scale um, so I've been thinking about scale and talking to lots of different people about scale for a really long time um, after my residency I wrote an essay with uh, Christina uh, for Logic Mag Magazine, um, and Christina opens up the essay with this beautiful uh, 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 quote that I, I just just blows my mind, and I'm just going to read it um, for the benefit of uh, everyone on, on the call. It's, a single E. coli placed in a sugary broth will divide into two genetically identical cells in 20 minutes. Another 20 minutes later, those two will grow and divide into four. Give the, those cells enough broth and room to grow, and after about 23 hours, there will be enough E. coli cells to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool. Wait another 20 hours and the mass of bacteria would equal the volume of the earth, round, rounded up to 48 hours and you'd have a ball of E. coli, 22 times the size of Jupiter. And that's kind of the growth mindset I think that the humans have had on this planet. Grow, 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 grow and exceed all boundaries. And of course, this isn't going to happen in nature because of biological contingency. So how do you start to think about the scale up of fermentation processes to produce a yarn um, next to the reality that this is what landfill looks like in the textile and fashion industries. Um, the consumer uh, logic uh, has it that everything is disposable. Can we find a system of production um, that is more in keeping with where we need to go. And so to kind of interrogate um, this disconnect between the, these potentially incredible technologies that are um, in the pipeline um, relative to the system in which they're going to exist within, um, I partnered with uh, a friend, Daisy Ginsberg, um, to edit MIT Media Lab uh, and uh, MIT Press's Journal of Design and Science. Uh, we, we co-edited issue four together, where we were asking, are there not other biological futures 
that are not driven by this same logic? Um, can we start to map out other strategies that incorporate systems um, and our need to live and to live well on this planet? Um, I won't spend too much time talking about the editorial, but I think what is worth um, highlighting as a design project um, that we realized that we were kind of accusing people in the industry of having very limited imagination about what biology can do, um, but our imagination was limited too because biodesign and how it was being framed was being framed as if you had to go to school to be able to do it, even though none of us did. <laughs> um, it was being framed as an elite uh, sport, if we like, and we just realized that because of that framing, we were missing so many stories from all over the world, from different kinds of practitioners who are asking these questions, but in fundamentally different contexts. So part of our MO with this project was how do we step outside our bubble and bring in people um, and facilitate conversation between those people in an equitable way so that they can share their stories. Uh, and I'll just um, highlight uh, Chido Govere and Josh Evans thinking edibility otherwise um, a, a conversation between uh, a, an, an activist in Zimbabwe um, who is working with food systems and uh, Josh Evans, who's an academic at uh, Cambridge, I would say, um, uh, Cambridge UK, um, you, you know, and together they talk about decolonizing um, edibility and what that means um, for, for uh, social structures. Um, and Chido is not somebody who's going to put her hand up and say I'm a biodesigner, but she's engaged in a community um, and uh, really trying to put forward uh, the ecosystems that she exists within and how they relate with that community in, in such a compelling way. Um, uh, there's so many amazing conversations here. I would just say if you want to unpack a little bit more of it, uh, go to Jods. It's free to access uh, and it's an interactive um, interface that allows you to actually leave your own comments uh, and in the public domain. Um, the 10th essay from this collection was uh, an essay between uh, or a conversation between Donna Haraway, uh, and, who is a uh, science and technology and society theorist, and um, Drew Endy. Um, and they have this fascinating conversation that ends with Donna sort of imploring us that we need to tell new stories, we need to find new imaginary spaces. Um, we need to be able to offer that alternative. And the way in which we do that is to, style, is to tell stories. So how do you take a project like that with a call to arms uh, like that and start to figure out ways of actually building this into, um, uh, into a doing space um, and building it into a framework where people actually have the power to make things hap happen. Um, so COVID-19 hits, uh, everything shuts down, uh, and uh, after sort of a couple of years of toing and froing about key subject areas that interest us, Christina Agapakis and I, um, you know, sat down and thought, how can we bring these conversations to the fore? Um, Ginkgo Bioworks normally hosts ferment around about this time um, at their Boston um, offices. Uh, and everyone knew that ferment, um, the conference was not going to happen. So what if instead we created a virtual gathering space to have some of these more, uh, <laughs> I want to say fringe, um, but less corporatized um, conversations? How do we create an opening um, within this moment to have a real-time dialogue about the world as it is shifting, but fundamentally how um, the biotech industries are going to fit um, in a world post-COVID-19. So we partnered with Ginkgo um, uh, to be, as, as thought partners and producers of what would be Ferment TV. Uh, we built the brand um, and really tried to be considered in the, the, the and, and deliberate about the kinds of stories that we wanted to uh, unearth. Um, can biotech uh, be a space where we consider how we build these technologies for uh, a world that can thrive? 
Um, can it be a space for caretaking? Can it be a space for belonging? Can it be a space for innovating? Um, and, and can we build it to be a, a space for living? That says thriving, it should say living. Um, and, and who are the people who um, are working, not just in biotech, but in connected spaces, uh, who are already tackling um, these core issues? So in our launch series, uh, over three months um, between um, some point this year, I have no concept of time anymore, <laughs> sort of in the summer, basically, we brought together this incredible cohort um, of, uh, of, of, of individuals uh, and again invited them to talk to one another uh, live on camera <laughs> um, and, and uh, in a disembodied way, um, but to talk to each other about um, their visions for biotechnology, um, how the, the pandemic was playing out and the systemic issues of, of racism that were determining who got care and who did not get care. Uh, we talked to um, practitioners who are interested in food futures and how this relates to this kind of obsession with um, uh, the, the molecule or the ingredient in biotechnology as opposed to seeing it as part of um, the, the bigger whole. Um, and one, I'm uh -huh. so sorry to interrupt, but we're actually over time. So if you're able to, okay. uh, yeah, I'm so sorry, uh, but- No, no, it's okay. I've I'm got two more slides, but yes, I'm, I'm okay, wrapping perfect. up. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, and, and I just want to draw your attention to, to, to this because it, it really stayed with me. Um, Daisy Ginsburg asks, are we making a synthetic biology that's set up for us as consumers, not as citizens? And if it is about us as citizens and members of the planet with other species, is the model really about care rather than consuming? What would that synthetic biology look like? To which Drew responds, when we talk about synthetic biology, I wish for a conversation about what we wish for. Do we share any dreams in common? And if they are not good enough, then we have to work at it. So I'm out of time, but I very quickly want to show you how we think we might be able to work through it and the cultural shifts that kind of lead to outcomes, perhaps. If we're talking about design justice, then we need to create um, systems that can um, create access for people. If we're talking about acknowledging diversity of realities, then perhaps we can build systems that distribute benefits. If we're talking about degrowth, then we have to build systems that uh, offer alternative uh, ways to measuring success and value beyond GDP. Um, and we need to contract our consumption and demand. Um, and if we want to create a shift where we actually think about healing both people and planet, then we do need to start to uh, engage with decolonial practices and across the political realm, as well as the question of how land is distributed on this planet so that we can steward it better. And on that, I will end. Thank you very much. Natsad, that was just sensational. Um, can we all give some some claps and some snaps and some love for Natsai? Um, and I felt so bad too, because your, your closing slide, I th thought really summarized and hit a lot of notes we've been talking about over the course of the past couple of days. This question of mm -hmm. consumerism versus citizenship, huge theme yesterday, and I think a huge theme for this entire conference. And I also love how you brought healing into the picture as well, um, which in a way is a really lovely segment, a segue into so the, cardi the conversation around guardianship of ecosystems, which is gonna be um, the next, uh, the next uh, discussion that we're gonna have. Um, but Natsai, I also noticed that the chat has been like, bananas the whole time you have been oh. talking yeah it is just people this are is so just, cool yeah the, the, just spend a little time after now, now that um, <laughs> you're, you're done speaking just to uh, look and engage because people are just um oh, I think so pieces of people's brains and minds are like kind of scattered around the walls of, of various rooms right now so um please engage with folks on the chat and and not so I, I, I did see that you joined the slack channel um joined the slack workspace so yes you know, we, we are we are in a way um, because of the global nature of the event. Um, you know, there there are, there are hundreds of people here, but then there are also people not here who are also participating in the asynchronous workspace. So um, I think people would love to engage with you more there as well. So mm -hmm. if you're able to um, hop onto the Slack, I'm sure you'll have a lot of people very very excited to talk to you more. 
Um, no, so absolutely. And thank you. And this is such an incredible community. I wish we were in person next time. <laughs> we will. We absolutely will. And, and yeah, Natsa, just, just thank you so much again. This was really, really spectacular. And I thought just um, hit so many of the core themes and notes of what we've been talking about and what we will continue to talk about. So um, everybody, let's just do some more snaps and love for Natsa. That was just so phenomenal.